Hello, my dear friends. Today we will take a look at the memoirs of Herbert Kraft, who was a soldier in the Waffen-SS division Totenkopf. The story will be about the mass murder of British prisoners of war, which happened on May 27, 1940, during the French campaign of the Wehrmacht. The soldiers of the 2nd Battalion of the Royal Norfolk Regiment were isolated from the other units and they occupied a farm building in Le Paradis, fighting back the advance of Waffen-SS soldiers. When they ran out of ammunition, they were forced to give themselves up to the Germans. But the Germans took them across the road, put them against the wall of a barn, and executed them with machine guns in cold blood. There were 97 British soldiers killed, and only two survived, who escaped but were later taken prisoner by the Germans. Now, before I dive into today's topic, I want to show you how you can do some research into your own family tree and find out more about your ancestors. This is actually fairly easy to do thanks to today's sponsor, MyHeritage. You can begin by making a simple tree using the names of your parents and grandparents. MyHeritage will then help you grow your tree even further by automatically giving you discovery links. Using this method, I was able to get the name of the great-great-great-great-grandfather, William Mitchell. But what if I want to know what his occupancy was? Well, all I have to do is click on his box and select Research This Person. Then, this connects me to over 19 billion records that MyHeritage gives me access to. Next, I'm going to choose Census Lists, UK and Ireland Census, and finally, 1871 Census. And here, I was able to learn that great-great-great-great-grandfather's wife's name was Hannah. I can even view the original document. Note that the occupation column says that he was a part of the militia. If you'd like to research more about your own ancestors, MyHeritage is offering military club viewers a 14-day free trial followed by 50% off a premium membership. You can sign up right now by using the links in the description or pinned comment. We will see this story through the eyes of a German soldier. Let's begin. We were briefed about the situation on the evening of May 26, 1940. The Royal Norfolk and Royal Scottish Regiments of the British Expeditionary Force were in front of us defending. Our second and third companies were already in the process of preparing to cross the canal. Our liaison squad was attached to the first company, that is, to my former company commander. The communication with the battalion command post was established by light telephone cable. It was still daylight when the second and third companies, under the pouring rain and heavy artillery fire coming from the right side of us, crossed the canal on bridges rebuilt by our sappers and immediately captured the area. While the sappers worked on improving the ferry, we moved to the just recaptured village under cover of darkness, and there we took up rapidly established positions. Early in the morning of May 27th, our liaison squad was ordered to arrive immediately at the third company command post because there the entire liaison squad was out of service. The command post of the company commander, Hauptsturmführer Kochlein, was located on old World War I positions in a wooded area. At once, we re-established communication with the battalion command post by reconnecting the cable that had been broken in many places by British shelling. The sun rising up lazily from the morning fog was a chance to continue the offensive. A road sign pointed to Le Corne Malo. The mortars and heavy machine guns took up a firing position near the forest edge and opened fire on the designated enemy targets in the village a hundred meters away, while the riflemen moved in on either side of the road. I ran across a young British man. His face reflected exasperation and deadly fear. He was leaning with his back against an earth mound, with an expression of hopelessness in his eyes, while blood ran wildly from a wound in his neck. His arms struggled in vain to clamp the artery to keep life in his body. It would be impossible to rescue him, even with the help of others. Next, all of a sudden, the machine gun bursts hit the squad moving along the hidden path and made them a bunch of scattered human bodies. One of them got up and staggered, with his finger pushing a hole in his belly, and wandered past me to the rear. The snipers fired from the rooftops of the houses in the village we were attacking, which forced us to huddle on the ground and caused us heavy losses. When we tried to treat the wounded, we noticed that some of them had exit wounds as big as a fist and there was no way to save them. They were bleeding to death in front of our eyes. We suspected that the British were using hollow-point bullets prohibited by international conventions. The sniper's fire continued to push us to the ground. Each man tried to take cover or hid their head in the grass. The heavy machine guns became quiet. 
Their first numbers were lying with horrible wounds near their guns. Only the crews of the two mortars in the World War I crater survived unharmed and intensified their firing at anything that might give cover to the snipers. This gave us enough time to get our wounded out of the way. When the mortars ran out of ammo, the British again dominated the battlefield. The wounded men told us that during the attack, their squad had broken into enemy position. The British surrendered after a brief melee and asked for help for two wounded men lying under blankets. As the squad went on the attack, these supposedly wounded men began throwing hand grenades at the soldiers who had shown them mercy. The wounds caused by the special projectiles and the stories of the wounded made us sober and gave us a new view of the enemy. After an incident of the same act of treachery had occurred in the forest, it made us believe that this treacherous way of fighting had been adopted by the enemy. It was only a few hours later, after the defenders in Le Cornmalo had been shelled from several sides at once, that our company managed to proceed on the offensive and break into the village. Those British who survived fell back in the direction of Le Paradis. The fire of the enemy ceased instantly. The ammunition was brought to the front line. The wounded waited for evacuation. The units that had suffered casualties gathered together. Some men were eating from their bread bags, not caring at all about the consequences of being wounded in the abdomen. The road alongside which we had laid out our killed men on the lawn, and along which we took up the fight again, led us toward a larger settlement. We advanced in a general direction to the northeast. Before long, the machine gun bursts of an invisible enemy were striking. The flooded ditches, hedgerows, haystacks, isolated yards, tall grass, and dense young wheat gave the enemy riflemen a perfect opportunity to use the area. Everywhere you could find lurking snipers and machine gun nests. The supporting mortars failed to give their full effect. The field in front of Le Paradis was wide and flat. The British defenses defended with unusual bravery and bitterness. The losses in killed and wounded were multiplying. There again, a totally invisible enemy, surprising us with his abilities, had us pinned to the ground. By all means, we had to get them. We crawled on all fours and crawled on our hands and knees to approach the enemy, and they moved back skillfully and without being seen. However, we had to cover thousands of meters to reach the target of the attack, and after the meadow, giving us cover, a wide and flat plowed field began. To overcome it without support would be pure suicide. I recalled the training at the firing range. At that time, the artillery had supported us perfectly. A show-off, I was thinking to myself this time. I had no clue where our guns, made in the Skoda factories, had been during all this time. The command post of our battalion commander, Sturmbannführer Fortenbacher, a veteran of World War I, had been relocated to the front line. I was supposed to roll up the cable to the former command post and run a line of communication to the new one. Scolding, and on all fours, I made it all the way, while rolling the 500-meter cable up on a small reel. What a hate I had for this kind of troops. The moment I got out of range of the Tommy gun fire, I immediately started looking for a new command post. There, I had to connect the new line and get back to the 3rd Nochlein Company. By this time, the enemy there had retreated to Le Paradis. We pushed on. The artillery and heavy machine guns could again fire on the targets identified. Notwithstanding this, the enemy resistance remained so effective that we suffered heavy losses on the approaches to this village. We were again forced to the ground. Each attempt to break into Le Paradis in one dash resulted in heavy casualties. From the command post of the 1st Battalion, we could see the field in front of the 3rd Company, as I was able to see for myself. It was reasonably assumed that it simply could not go on like this. Where were the tanks and artillery of our division? When the telephone rang, I reported to the company commander a howitzer had taken up firing positions behind us, which was to overcome the resistance of the defenders of the village. Not long after, the first shell passed over our heads and hit a nearby farmhouse. Then, shell after shell, it started hitting the supposed positions. Here, it was enough for white flags to be seen. The ruins, fire, and thick smoke show the spots where the shells hit. We have to overcome the last hundred meters. And then again, the advancing troops began to be wiped out by machine gun bursts from a massive multi-story building. They were accompanied by the frequent rifle fire, and the comrades began to fall to the ground again. We tried to use each bump, every tiny hollow in the cropland. Nobody dared to entrench in order not to draw the attention of snipers, and our howitzer was silent. Bloody hell! They should have seen the situation we were in, or maybe the gun crew was killed too. But then the shells began to hit the central building in the village, from which the defenders were shooting at us intensely. 
I observed from my position that during the artillery fire, the motorcyclists drove into the village from the other side and engaged in a firefight. Hauptsturmführer Nochlein signaled the attack. Covered by effective artillery fire, we moved closer to the village, where the motorcyclists were now engaged in active combat without much loss. In a short time, the white flags appeared. We watched distrustfully and with all possible precautions the British getting out and handing themselves over. Most of them were wounded. The severe battle for Le Bas Canal and Le Paradis was over. I met a comrade I had known since recruitment days. Here's what he told me. The British soldiers who were in one of the barns surrendered by hanging out a white flag. The fire was stopped. When the Germans stepped out of hiding and approached, they were killed by machine gun fire from the other side of the barn. Thereafter, a German machine gun opened fire on the British who had slid back into the barn. Ten British were killed. Some of the British men managed to make it through to the north. The defenders of Le Paradis who survived were coming out of their hiding places in the stable, attics, and cellars. When we thought that the village had already been purged of the enemy, suddenly the shots came from its outskirts. Behind a well-camouflaged British machine gun, which we at first ignored as having been abandoned by the crew, the gunners again took up their position and opened fire. Three of my comrades in the machine gun company became the last victims of that battle. As the units gathered, our killed soldiers were buried in graves that had been hastily dug. They rested where they died. Three of them were buried in one grave near the British machine gun that shot them down. Six were buried together in the midst of growing wheat near a lonely gun on the bank of the canal, and the rest were buried outside the houses of the village. To make the crosses, the planks were torn from the fence. The names of those who rested in the ground were written on them hastily by hand. There was no singing of the song about the good comrade, no gun salute, no words about the heroic death. All we had to do was think, today you, tomorrow us. The battle for Labas Canal came at a cost to our young division of 157 killed and over 500 wounded. The vehicles arrived, delivered ammunition and supplies. The wounded were sent to the main dressing station. The weakened units were reinforced with men and weapons. I was just removing a cable from the plowed field left behind when I spotted a small group of British captives near the farm. Those who were healthy were standing. The wounded were sitting and lying on the ground. Some of them were handing me their family pictures with desperate gestures. Do they expect us to let them go? Looking closer, I noticed two heavy machine guns in front of them. While I was thinking how a couple of fine machine guns had been placed to guard the prisoners, instead of just keeping them in a cellar with one man on guard, a dreadful thought hit me. I asked the nearest machine gun crew what was going on. I got a calm reply. They will be executed. I could not believe what I heard, and thought that these words meant a bad joke, so I asked again. Who ordered this? Hauptstrom Führer Nochlein. At that moment, I realized that it was very serious. I rushed off to find my squad in order not to be a witness to the execution of the prisoners, who were expecting to die with family pictures in their hands. There had just been the use of horrible, totally unknown to us ammunition used by the Tommies, and their behavior in front of our fellows who wanted to forgive them, and now there would be the upcoming murder of all the captives in execution of a hastily issued order. Were they all guilty? I don't know of any prisoners who were forgiven. Whether it was the hollow point bullets or the ammunition, unknown to us, not listed in the convention? Might the unexpected firing of a British machine gun at the moment of general surrender have been caused by lack of control and nerves? Were ten British killed and few more among us the result of insufficient understanding? Was I trying to build golden bridges? A day later, while we fought our way westward, Major Reederer from 89th Army Headquarters found unarmed British soldiers lying in a heap, shot dead. An immediate report was made by him to the headquarters of the 16th Army Corps. I don't know how often the brutal crime was considered by the enemy as a matter of course assessment, an incident during the course of combat operations. Consequently, SS Hauptsturmführer Fritz Nochlein, the officer responsible for this war crime, was convicted after the war and executed in 1949. The two soldiers who survived were key witnesses in the Le Paradis massacre trial. That is all for today. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like and support the channel by subscribing. Bye everyone, see you all again.